Shabbat Shalom, and let's all please mute ourselves, and we're going to begin with the blessing for studying Torah. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of all who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to engage with words of Torah. So I believe that we are at the end of uh, chapter seven of the book of Judges. So we're just gonna read the very ending and just uh, recap where we are. So we're talking about Gideon, that particular judge. And um, I believe we ended with verse 18. I had asked, uh, Lynn, but we couldn't remember. And then I thought, you know what? I have a video of this session and I can find out where we ended by looking at the videotape. So I believe we're at verse 19. So remember Gideon is a, uh, a judge who seems to keep needing reassurance from God that he has actually been chosen by God and that he can defeat all of these enemies. And he just, as you may recall, they did something interesting where they blew the, the horns and they uh, had these lanterns and glass and they made noise and all of this stuff just to make it seem like there were way more people than there actually were and they, and they won. Um, and we ended uh, here, when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon and um, I don't know if we read 19 or not, but Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran crying out as they fled. So again, very smart move you have he only remember he only had 300 men to work with because god wanted to show how powerful god was so he didn't god didn't want uh the israelites to think that it was because of their own power that they were able to overcome the enemy but at the same time even with just a few hundred men they were very smart about making all this noise and and these lights and everything and as i think i mentioned it reminded me of what the the israelis did uh, during the 73 war when they were on the Golan Heights doing something very similar with noise and lights and stuff to make it seem like there were many more people. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. So now you have the enemy fighting itself. The army fled to Beth Shita towards Zerera, as far as the border of Abel Mahola near Tabith. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and Al Manasseh were called out and they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they seized the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Barah. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Ze'eb, remember their names. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Ze'eb at the wine press of Ze'eb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Ze'eb to Gideon who was by the Jordan. They brought the heads, the actual <laughs> heads. Okay, so now they know that these guys are dead. All right, so we're gonna pick it up at Judges 8. And would somebody like to read? I'll do it. Is that all right, Rabbi? Thanks, Jane, that's great. Okay. Now the Ephraim, uh, Eph Ep Ephraimites. Ephraimite, ask Gideon. Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. But he answered them, what have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abiezer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, the resentment against him subsided. And let me just stop you for one moment. So you see sure. here that Gideon 
is has become a kind of uh, as uh, I think it's um, Robert Alter says a uh, skilled rhetoric. Uh, he's skilled at rhetoric um, because he's able to mollify the Ephraimites. Right? They're saying, "Why didn't you call us to fight this war?" And he says, "Hey, you're so much better than we are. Well, look what you did. You got these two guys, you know, Oreb and Zeb, and." Look, look a little old me. All I did was defeat the Midianites. Uh, you know, whatever. Um, so he's able to mollify them quite quickly. Okay, please keep going. Okay, Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. He said to the men of Sukkot, give my troops some bread. They are worn out and I am pursuing Zabab and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. But the officials of Sukkot said, do, do you already have the heads of Zaba and Zalmunna? Hands, in your, oh, the hands of Zabab and Zalmunna in your possession. Why should we give bread to your troops? Then Gideon replied, just for that. When the Lord has given Zaba and Zalmunna into my hand, I will tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. Okay, so let me stop you there for a second. So basically the officials of Sukkot, the leaders of that area, don't believe that Gideon is going to be able to be successful. When he says, do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? That is not a metaphor because apparently when you defeated an enemy, you cut their hands off, okay? I guess sometimes you cut their head and sometimes their hand. Um, so you don't have their hands, meaning you haven't been able to overcome them. And so these people don't even give so much as bread to the troops, like the troops are hungry mm -hmm. and they won't even give them bread, much less anything else. And so Gideon says, okay, you're gonna get punished. Um, I'm gonna tear your flesh with thorns and briars, which was actually what he's gonna do, mm. which is a very painful way to die. But that's the punishment for refusing to give any kind of uh, help to this uh, community, to these soldiers. Um, yeah, okay, let me just move okay. down a little bit. Okay, thanks. From there, he went up to Peniel and made the same request of them, but they answered as the, man, the men of Sukkot had. So he said to the men of Peniel, when I return in triumph, I will tear down this tower. Now, Zaba and Zalmunna were in Karkor with a force of about 15,000 men, all that were left of the armies of the Eastern peoples. 120,000 swordsmen had, fa had fallen. Gideon went up by the route of the nomads east of Noba and Yobaha and attacked the unsuspecting army. Zaba and Zalmunna, the two kings of Midian, fled but he pursued them and captured them, routing their entire army. Gideon, son of Yoash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Herez. He caught a young man of Sukkot and questioned him. And the young man wrote down for him the names of the 77 officials of Sukkot, the elders of the town. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Sukkot, here are Zaba and Zalmunna, about whom you taunted me by saying, do you ha already have the hands of Zabat and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Sukkot a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. Then he asked Zabat and Zalmunna, what? kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Men like you, they answered, each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Yether, his oldest son, he said, kill him. <laughs> But Yether did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and was afraid. Zaba and Zalmunna said, come do it yourself. 
as is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them and took the ornaments off their camel's necks. So the reason Gideon is going to kill these people is because it's blood vengeance, right? He's yeah. actually obliged to kill them because uh, his own family was killed. And so therefore they, they need to die as well. It's a family affair. Mm. Okay, thank you know, you're doing a great job. These are, oh, Jenny, yes. Jenny, you're muted. Uh, yes, I was just reflecting on our discussion last week of how Gideon uh, was seen as obedient, um, you know, and how he had started out being sort of fearful and needing a lot of reassurance and his character has really evolved. Mm, good, good, yes. And as I mentioned at the beginning, he's actually good at, you know, persuading people who are unhappy that things are actually, you know, okay, right? You're, you're much more skilled than I am, uh, so don't worry about it. Thanks. Any other comments before we continue? Okay, so Jane, do you want to keep reading? Yeah, I can. Okay. So we're up to uh, Gideon's death, right? Uh, the, the, no, no, yeah. no, his ephod. The ephod, remember the high priest wears an ephod, uh, which is like a- Oh, oh yeah, I see. Is it, right, what is that, a, a, a shield or something over your chest? It's something that you wear in your chest. And remember the the high priest had it and in it were the Urim and Tumim, which were the uh, those little stones that they threw to try to predict what was gonna happen, which is of course con completely contrary to the kind of religion that Israelites are supposed to be practicing, but oh well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay uh the israelites said to gideon rule over us you your son and your grandson because you have saved us from the hand of midian but gideon told them i will not rule over you nor will my son rule over you the lord will rule over you and he said i do have one request that each of you give me an airing from your share of the plunder it was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1700 shekels, not counting the ornaments, the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on their camel's necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Oprah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this, and then I'm, I'm going to find you a, a picture of the ephod. It's actually a linen garment. Okay, here are various pictures of the ephod. The high priest, he wore the, the ephod, and then over it is the uh, breastplate. Um, here's R Rashi's, I don't know if that's R Rashi's picture, but so it's, it's this uh, linen garment underneath here. Um, but it said he, he made it out of gold. Yeah, well, it seems like, see here it says ephod, and I think, I think it's used to mean a couple of different things. Um, see, it says a sleeveless garment worn by Jewish priests. That's the definition, but I think it also gets used to mean other things. Artifact and object to be revered. Okay, in the Bible, uh, it's usually described as being linen, but did not constitute complete clothing, da da da. Uh, robe of fine linen, da da da. Gold, blue, purple, scarlet threads. So it was woven with all these different threads, it was made of fine linen. I'm, I'm just using the Jewish study Bible and it says the ephod is mentioned in various contexts. It seems a reference here is to a statue intended a statue. to, a statue uh -huh. intended wow. to commemorate the deliverance, which over the course of time became an object of pagan adulation and is reminiscent of the golden calf story. 
Well, that's what I was going to say about the the rest of this here, but I just want to see something. If, if I'm trying to see if um, Alter has a note about it. I have the note. Oh, you do? Yeah. Gideon made them into an ephod. The clear allusion in this episode is to Aaron's fashioning the golden calf from the golden ornaments that he collects from the Israelites. Right, in other right, right. Context, the ephod the ephod is a priestly breastplate or an oracular device. The latter function, the latter function may come into play here. In any case, the declaration that Israel went whoring after it clearly indicated that it was treated as a sacred icon to be worshipped instead of God. Right. I mean, I was going to say that this business of here. Let me just share the, uh, the text here. So first of all, the Midianites apparently wore gold rings and he made it into, now, usually the ephod is, is linen. So how it became some kind of a, an idol, I'm not sure. Okay, I, I have to look into this a little more. Um, but, but the point is that yes, there is the uh, echo of the golden calf right here, definitely. Um, Rabbi? Um, yeah. Rabbi? I think the confusion actually comes in uh, Shemot, in Exodus, when uh, they're describing all the priestly garments and the ark and all of that. Because just reading this, I realized that I have always confused the ephod with the breastplate. Yes, exactly. Always. And that comes from Exodus. That comes from the description, I'm, I'm sure of it. Um, I know, because the, those I thought, pictures I that we saw, that in the show, had, you know, I found a reference in here, Rabbi. Yes, yeah. this is in the Oxford Companion. Okay, and it has just a short entry, but <clears throat> the first part says the the for the most part refers to the garment worn by the priests, but then the second paragraph says a totally different usage comes in the Book of Judges, where Gideon and later others constructed a gold ephod as a graven image. So they are acknowledging that this did not have a consistency and that it can mean both thank things you. depending on where you're finding it so thank you hmm. yeah i think you're right because well what i noticed in the wikipedia is there were there were pictures of the breastplate when i looked up ephod and i'm like how is this the breastplate okay so it's a word that seems to be used for various items that the priest wore very confusing um Okay, so what I did want you to notice as well is that they want him to become the king and he refuses. That's really important because remember later on after this book, when we get to the book of Samuel, the people will again ask for a king and Samuel will say, no, you should not have a king because remember there's only one king and who's that? God. God. And yet he gives in to them and, you know, he, he warns them what's going to happen to the king. He's going to, you know, end up accumulating a lot of horses and money and all of that. And uh, that's exactly what happens with Solomon, which ends up breaking up the kingdom. And remember what Deuteronomy says that a king is supposed to do. Anybody remember what the king's supposed to do? Yeah, write his Torah. That's mm -hmm. all he's supposed to do, sit around writing a Torah. Um, Sorry, okay. my hand went the wrong way because I was writing in English. It should have been. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and by the way, the Midianites are descendants of Ishmael. Oh. Ah. So, yeah, so they're not like people that we feel really too positive about, right? Yeah, but Ishmael was part of the, co uh, the covenant and he was circumcised. Mm. So, you know, yeah, we have more in common with Ishmael than we're willing to admit. He's our cousin. <laughs> What's that, Susie? He's our cousin. Yeah, he definitely. Is. definitely. He's but remember cousin. how, you know, the Bible keeps taking two brothers and making one the good one and one the bad one, like Jacob and Esau. Poor Esau, I've always felt really badly for him. Okay. So let's, um, any, unless anyone has anything else, thank you for asking those questions. Because I kind of saw ephod and just blanked over it. 
easier than trying to figure out why it means two different things. <laughs> well, there's, um, also, there's also that whole thing about the word prostituted themselves, which, yeah. seems, which seems a pretty um, harsh choice of verb. Um, well, know. you know, the prophet Hosea, when he describes Israel and what they do in relation to God, basically talks about them prostituting themselves also because they're supposed to be, you know, married to God. And instead of that, they go after other, other gods and they are prostituting themselves. Yeah. Hosea has pretty harsh language, as a matter of fact. I'm amazed that we still even read it given all the criticism mm -hmm. of non-politically correct uh, words and, and, and images. Um, yeah, so they're out, they're out prostituting themselves. One question? Yeah. Um, also, at the, oh, can I see that text again? Sure. So as far as the worshiping the golden idol, maybe this line, it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Maybe mm -hmm. that's what that means. Meaning what? That the, the gold plate was actually like a golden idol. Oh, absolutely. Yes. This, what they did here, he supposedly made this ephod. Now, this ephod cannot be the same ephod as the priest's uh, breastplate, because I, if they worship that, that I, I don't think that would necessarily be so terrible. I think he made something, we don't know what, out of gold. Mm. And it is very much parallel to the golden calf. They're worshiping something made out of gold. It became a snare to them in the sense that, uh, oh, you know, gold is glimmering and, uh, you know, it's attracting people. So that's, uh, it's almost like uh, they can't help themselves, right? Um, and they start worshiping this. And even Gideon and his family, and you'll see why in a moment, why it says his family, uh, they're going after other gods and they're not being, you know, moral and all the things they're supposed to be if they follow the God of our tradition. Okay, um, do you want to just finish this chapter? Yeah, okay. sure. Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. Yerubbaal, son of Yoash, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His <laughs> concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Yoash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father, Yoash, and Ophrah of the Abiz, Abiz, Abizrites. Yeah, that's an easy one. Abizrites, yeah. I, I didn't get the R. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. They set up Baal Brith as their God and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Yerub Baal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. Okay, so Jerub Baal is another name for Gideon. Um, it's interesting the word Baal is in there, uh, perhaps suggesting something about where their family is gonna go off to, which is to uh, worship other gods, like Baal being the major god of the Canaanites. Um, so you notice that he had lots of kids and one kid from a concubine. So therefore not as legitimate as the other sons. And his name is Avimelech. And what do you see in that name? What word? My father, the king. Abi king. is my king. father. Melech is the king. Okay. So Melech means king. And remember Gideon refuses to be king. And this kid takes on the name of my father was king. And you're going to see what that means in a moment. So he's the son of a concubine and uh, he's taking on this name. And during Gideon's lifetime, everything was fine for 40 years. But then in the pattern that we've talked about, this Deuteronomic history, you see the Israelites prostituting themselves, 
once the king is gone and they you know do bad things and they get punished and eventually god tries to help them out by sending another good good judge but not right now okay so this, is, this is a self it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy because joshua said at the beginning in the book of joshua he said you're never going to be able to do this you're never going to live up to uh uh, worshiping only one God and being devoted to that God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, God, I think, seems to expect this of them as well. Oh, by the way, one thing that, um, go back here for a second to chapter eight. Wait a minute. Let me go backwards. So at the end of Gideon's life, uh, he went home to live, and that's apparently a subtle criticism because why is he stopping judging and making sure that the Israelites are doing what they're supposed to do, right? They're supposed to be worshiping our God, not Baal. And, you know, when he made this ephod, he wasn't necessarily making it as a an idol to worship. However, that's what happened. And he didn't watch out for the people and make sure that they were behaving the way they were supposed to behave, right? So now we're going to go and see what happens next. Would somebody like to read about Abimelech? Jason, maybe? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, my, my throat's got a little, if oh, I get caught up, I'll tell, rather not? <clears throat> I'll tell you if I have to stop. Okay. Abimelech, son of Jerub Baal, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them and to all his mother's clan, ask all the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you, to have all 70 of Jerub Baal's sons rule over you or just one man? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. When the brothers repeated all this to the citizens of Shechem, they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is related to us. They gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Barith, and Abimelech used it to hire reckless scoundrels who became his followers. He went to his father's home in Ophrah, and on one stone murdered his 70 brothers, the sons of Jerubal. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubal, escaped by hiding. Then all the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. Okay, so let's stop for just a moment. So first of all, Abimelech appeals to the people of Shechem by saying, I'm related to you so that they'll give him preferential treatment. This is the first time now since this, this people was formed, Israel, that somebody takes power by uh, illegal means, as opposed to, let's say, God saying to him, you are now the next judge. Um, and he slaughters all of his brothers, as you see. Not a really great way to take, well, except for the one who escapes. The other thing is Shechem uh, is a city of refuge. Remember the cities of refuge are places where people go who um, have inadvertently killed somebody. And it's sort of a place where they, they're protected until the uh, high priest dies, at which point they're allowed to leave. So it's kind of a city of scoundrels anyway. And he hires some of them to, to kill his brothers. Um, all right, so that's a little bit of background about what's going on here. All also, right. she also Shechem is the place it's really supposed to be a holy place because it's the place where Abraham built the first altar to God mm. on his way to Canaan. So oh, well, you it, how far have we fallen? Oh, yeah. Well, we'll fall <laughs> way further. You'll see. We'll fall okay. way further. This is just the beginning. <laughs> okay. You want to go on, Jason? Sure. So when, <clears throat> when Jotham was told about this, he climbed on the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted to them, listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. One day, the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. They said to the olive tree, be our king. But the olive tree answered, should I give up my oil by which both gods and humans are honored to hold sway over the trees? Next, the trees said to the fig tree, come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, 
Should I give up my fruit so good and sweet to hold sway over the trees? Then the trees said to the vine, come and be our king. But the vine answered, should I give up my wine, which cheers both gods and humans to hold sway over the trees? Finally, all the trees said to the thorn bush, come and be our king. The thorn bush said to the trees, if you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. Okay, so first of all, thorn bush. Any shade you get from a thorn bush? Not usually. No, not really. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. He says, come, you know, he's the thorn bush and come get some shade from me. So obviously, since you don't get shade from a thorn bush, it's a pretty hollow promise. And remember that there's fire here because that's going to be important later. Um, I'm just going to read you a little note here from the art scroll on Jotham's parable and curse. Jotham, Gideon's orphan, went to Mount Gerizim overlooking Shechem and pronounced a parable and a curse. The moral of his parable was that three great judges could have claimed sovereignty if they had so wished, Otniel, Devorah, and Gideon, but they chose not to do so. Alternatively, the people of Shechem could have found Sterling and I'm sorry, could have found Sterling and accomplished leaders among Gideon's 70 sons, but none of them desired authority. In their place, the people of Shechem chose Avimelech, a person as inferior as a thorn, and they would pay a heavy price for their decision. Another commentator notes that not every part of the parable fits Jotham's lesson, but he wanted to add interest to his story. And by the way, Jotham is delivering his curse on the mountain that God chose for blessing. Remember, at the end of Deuteronomy, there are blessings and curses, and Mount Gerizim is where the blessings were pronounced. So <clears throat> this is like, like a, a misuse of this, of this mountain. And uh, the reason that the, this is happening on this mountain is in order to imply that the evil deeds of people can transform blessing into curse. So here's a mountain that should have given blessing, but it's actually going to give a curse. <clears throat> and the thorn bush is going to be the king. Okay, would you like to continue? <clears throat> okay. Have you acted honorably and in good faith by making Abimelech king? Have you been fair to Jerubal and his family? Have you treated him as he deserves? Remember that my father fought for you and risked his life to rescue you from the hand of Midian. But today <clears throat> you have revolted against my father's family. You have murdered his 70 sons on a single stone and have made Abimelech, the son of his female slave, king over the citizens of Shechem because he is related to you. So have you acted honorably and in good faith toward Jerubbaal and his family today? If you have, may Abimelech be your joy and may you be his too. But if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from you, the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. Thank you. Now, I, I want to go back one second to the um, to this parable, because I have some notes on that. Um, so Otniel is compared to a an olive tree. And remember that olive oil is used for the menorah in the temple. So that's a pretty elevated thing. Remember the fig tree is under which the judge Devorah used to judge. So that's a good thing. And also fig trees are sweet. Gideon is compared to a grapevine and we know what wine represents in our tradition and wine is also poured on the altar. And then Avimelech of course is compared to a thorn that produces no benefit to anyone. So all of these fig trees have some high purpose, and of course, the thorn bush does not. Um, and the note is that other trees prefer service to power, but thorn has nothing to give because it is dry and flammable. It can cause harm to surrounding trees. Okay, so just wanted to point that out about all these trees, and that's why they are used as metaphors. Okay, now. Here we are. Do you want to keep going or do you want someone else to read? Let's swatch, swap okay. it up. Okay, does someone else want to read? Susie? 
important. After Abimelech had governed Israel three years, God stirred up animosity between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem so that they acted treacherously against Abimelech. God did this in order that the crime against Yerub Baal's 70 sons, the, sh the shedding of their blood might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and on the citizens of Shechem who had helped him murder his brothers. In opposition to him, the citizens of Shechem set men on the hilltops to ambush and rob everyone who passed by. And this was reported to Abimelech. Okay, so as a punishment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for Abimelech having killed all his brothers and, and grabbing power, the Shechemites who had been the people who selected him are now going to uh, work against him and avenge him and also basically make any kind of passage through that area very dangerous because they're you know basically highway robbers. Okay. Now Gal, son of Ebed, moved with his clan to Shechem and its citizen put their confidence in him. After they had gone out into the fields and gathered the grapes and trodden them, they held a festival in the temple of their God. While they were eating and drinking, they cursed Abimelech. Then Gaal, son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech and why should we Shechemites be subject to him? Isn't he Yerubal's son? And isn't he Zebuld, his deputy? Serve the family of Amor and Shechem's father. Why should we serve Abimelech? If only this people were under my command, then I would get rid of him. <laughs> I would say to Abimelech, call out your whole army. When Zebul, the governor of the city, heard that Gaal, son of Ebed, said he was very angry, very angry, under cover he sent messengers to Abimelech saying, Gaal, son of Ebed, and his clan have come to Shechem and are stirring up the city against you. Now then, during the night, you and your men should come and lie in wait in the fields. In the morning, at sunrise, advance against the city. When Gaal and his men come out against you, seize the opportunity to attack them. So Abimelech and all his troops set out by night and took up concealed positions near Shechem in four companies. Now Gaal, son of Ebed, had gone out and was standing at the entrance of the city gate, just as Abimelech and his troops came out from their hiding place. <clears throat> then Gaal saw them, he said, when Gaal saw them, he said to Zebul, look, people are coming down from top of the mountains. Zebul replied, you mistake the shadows of the mountains for men. But Gaal spoke up again, look, people are coming down from the central hill and a company is coming from the direction of the diviner trees. Then Zebul said to him, where is your big talk now? You who said, who is Abimelech that we should be subject to him? Aren't these men you ridiculed? Go out and fight them. I'm gonna move this so that we are now at 39. Yeah. So God led out the citizens of Shechem and fought Abimelech. Abimelech chased them all the way to the entrance of the gate and many were killed as they fled. Then Abimelech stayed in Arumah and Zebul drove Gaal and his clan out of Shechem. The next day, the people of Shechem went out to the fields and this was reported to Abimelech. So he took his men, divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the fields. When he saw the people coming out of the city, 
he rose to attack them. Abimelech and the companies with him rushed forward to a position at the entrance of the city gate. Then two companies attacked those in the fields and struck them down. All that day, Abimelech pressed his attack against the city until he had captured it and killed its people. Then he destroyed the city and scattered salt over it. So that nothing could grow, basically, you know, scorched earth. <laughs> On hearing this, the citizens in the tower of Shechem went into the stronghold of the temple of El Berith. When Abimelech heard that they had assembled there, he and his and all his men went up to Mount Zalman. He took an axe and cut off some branches, which he lifted to his shoulders. He ordered the men with him, quick, do what you have seen me do. So all the men cut branches and followed Abimelech. They piled them against the stronghold and set it on fire with the people still inside. Wow. So all the people in the tower of Shechem, about a thousand men and women also died. So it's important that, you know, remember we compared Avimelech to a thorn bush that can be on fire because <clears throat> it's very flammable. And here, this is exactly what happens. He kills all these people by starting fire with all these branches. Now it's going to be very interesting to see how he dies. Next, Avimelech went to Thebes and besieged it and captured it. Inside the city, however, was a strong tower to which all the men and women, all the people of the city had fled. They had locked themselves in and climbed up on the tower roof. Abimelech went to the tower and attacked it. But as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire, a woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull. <laughs> Hurriedly, he called to his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me so that they can't say a woman killed him. So his servant ran him, ran him through and he died. When the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. Thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. God also made the people of Shechem pay for all their wickedness. The curse of Yotham, son of Yerubal, came on them. Thank you. So notice, first of all, that Abimelech had killed his brothers on a stone. Now he's being killed with a stone. Mm -hmm. Secondly, notice that he's being killed by a woman. Yes. And this is a little reminiscent of Yael pounding the head of, the, uh, of Sisera, the general. Um, and of course, the last thing this guy wants is for everyone to say he was killed by a woman. So he has somebody, you know, put a sword through him. Of course, now recorded forever after is the fact that he was killed by a woman. The, you know, worst possible way to die, right? <laughs> okay, uh, just checking to see if there are any comments because now we're gonna, after this, get to Jephthah. And that's another story of a woman, not such a happy one. Anybody have any comments, questions or anything? There are awful lot of killings. Yes, yes. And a lot of battles, mm. unfortunately. A lot of the history is battles. Mm. And as you see, we don't treat our enemies so lovely, you know, in such a lovely manner, right? Right. Throw them on, on briars and uh, thorns and roll them around until they die, which is a horrible way to die. We cut off their hands, uh, their heads, or burn people alive, reminiscent of what the Nazis did. Mm -hmm. Jason, did you want to? Well, it seems like there was very little mention of God in that whole Abimelech story. Like oh, yeah. when when somebody is 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 blessed, you know, by God to go forward, they repeat it over and over again. Mm -hmm. You know, this is doing and um and it 
and I think someone said it earlier that we just keep doing these these cycles, yep. these ups yep. and downs. And it makes you wonder how long that that has to go on before people get the message. <laughs> I have a little hint to tell you. They never, <laughs> never. get the mess. They never get the message ever because it goes on and on throughout the whole Bible and it never it never ends. They never get it. Spoiler alert. That wasn't fair. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Harvey. Harvey, you have your hand raised? Yes. I, I was wondering, is is there an archaeo archaeological um, uh, information showing that this actually happened, any of this actually happened? Because Not it seems like it's just a reoccurring theme throughout all the texts that, you know, the Jews went off they did something wrong god punished them they were okay for a while then they went off again god punished them again you know and it's like it was just a reoccurring theme <laughs> basically yeah, the whole thing yeah. is like propaganda yes you know? well i do think that that particular structure is something that was imposed on the material to prove a point right uh -huh. um but you know whether there were 40 years of peace and then you know i i don't know i mean they're the first bit of archaeological uh, material is a tiny little thing about King David. So that's much later. Okay, so we're going to go on with the next chapter. Uh, we're gonna get, so Jephthah, the next judge. <clears throat> and this is a very short chapter, which is good because then we get to the good stuff. Um, does anybody want to read? All right, I'll read this and then we'll see what, what happens at the next chapter. After the time I of- I thought I would. Oh, go, Sandy, please. I was muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> After the time of Abimelech, a man of Ishakar named Tola, son of Pua. Isn't she one of the midwives? Just a name. Yeah, yeah, she is. She is. She was the name of one of the midwives. Absolutely good. <laughs> the son of Dodo rose to save Israel. He lived in Shamir, in the hill country of Ephraim. He led Israel 23 years, and then he died and was buried in Shamir. Yair. He was followed by Yair of Gilead, who led Israel 22 years. He had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys. Why is that important? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um. They controlled 30 towns in Gilead, which to this day is called Havoth Yair. When Yair died, he was buried at Kamon. Again, the Israelites did evil in the, in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths Ast and the god, uh, gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the Ammonites and the gods of the Philistines. Remember, the Ashterah is the female consort of Baal, and she's often represented by, you know, a, a tree or something like that. Okay. Rabbi? Yeah. Um, Alter says that the donkeys are important. That's a good point, Sandra. Uh, I, that he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. In this period, donkeys, not horses, were the usual mounts for the nobility. Ah. So that's telling us this is a noble family then? Thank you, Jane. You're welcome. Now, obviously, you know, these people don't merit more than, you know, a line or two, but yeah, uh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, the, you know, actually camels weren't even known in this area at this time. Right. It, you know, they're always, if they see camels, they're like, whoa. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who gathered, who, who that year shat, shattered and crushed them. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan and Gilead, the land of the Amorites. The Amorites also crossed, crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. Israel was in great distress. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, we have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. 
The Lord replied, when the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonites, the Amalekites, and, yeah. <clears throat> and the Maonites oppressed you and you cried to me for help, did I not save you from their hands? But you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. But the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord, and he could bear Israel's misery no longer. When the Ammonites were called to arms and camped in Gilead, the Israelites assembled and camped at Mitzpah. The leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, Whoever will take the lead in attacking the Ammonites will be head over all who live in Gilead. Okay, so a couple of things. <clears throat> so um, the, Am the Ammonites here are considered the big enemy who refused passage to the Israelites when they were going through the desert. However, in the book of Numbers, it's the Moabites. Remember, we hate the Moabites because they wouldn't let us through. And so scholars think that this was possibly spliced in here from another source because it contradicts what it says in the book of Numbers. Um, and let's see. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, you see the same pattern here of the Israelites, you know, things were fine for a number of years with these other uh, judges and then they were bad. And then the Philistines among others were the ones who were gonna torture them, which is gonna be consistent throughout this history. The Philistines are the ones who are on the edge, the Western edge of, the, um, of this area. It's what really today is Gaza. So it was never part of Israel, that, that, that strip. Okay, so we're gonna go on and meet our friend Jephthah. Okay. Can I pause to point yeah, out please. that many, many moons ago, this is exactly where my Haftorah portion began. Oh, do you want to chant it for us? <laughs> I, I can't remember past Vayif Tak. That was the first word. <laughs> okay. And did you ever know what it was about? Well, I mean, I remember reading it and discussing it, but, you know, I, 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 the details are lost to me. Okay. Well, you were 13. And I'm way past 13. <laughs> Sandy, you want to keep reading? Sure. Jephthah the Gilead, Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His Gilead, mother was Gilead. Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Okay, so here again we see all these all these uh, judges, except for Deborah, all had some weird thing. You know, left hand, son of a prostitute, whatever. Okay, so. Clearly not of, uh, you know, high uh, lineage. Okay. Go ahead. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Top, Top, Top. Oh, where, probably, which is a gang of scoundrels <laughs> gathered around him and followed him. So let me just stop you for a second. Um, so he is the oldest son, because then Jephthah has a wife and she bears him a bunch of sons. Remember, the older son is supposed to inherit twice as much as the uh, younger ones, but they don't want him to get anything. So they're driving him away. And um, so, you know, he goes off and he gets a bunch of scoundrels to work with him, a little bit like David, which we'll see eventually. When poor King David became king, he was down in the southern kingdom of Judah, and he basically ran, ran a little operation of, uh, you know, what's it called, a, a protection, protection operation where, you know, you won't be attacked, we'll take care of you as long as you give us stuff um protection racket is what it's called um so this is a little bit uh echoing what david's going to end up doing so okay. jeff fled from his brothers and settled in the land of tob oh i got that sometime later when the ammonites were fighting against israel the 
elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, Sorry. Don't you, don't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fate the Ammonites and you will be head over all of us who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, <clears throat> the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the Iliad's elders of Gilead and the people made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all his words before the Lord of Mitzvah. Let somebody else read. Anybody else want to read? My voice is. Okay, I'll read. Then Jephthah. Read. Said, Baba. Oh, thank you, Sherry. When Jephthah sent mess messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, what do you have against me that you have attacked my country? The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah's messengers. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok, all the way to the Jordan. Now give it back peaceably. Jephthah sent back messengers to the Ammonite king saying, this is what Jephthah says. Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up out of Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and on to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, give us permission to go through your country. But the king of Edom would not listen. They sent also to the king of Moab and he refused. So Israel stayed at Kadesh. Next, they traveled through the wilderness, skirted the lands of Edom and Moab, passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab, and camped on the other side of the Anon, Arnon. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Ammon was its border. Is it Arnon or Ammon? I can't read that. It looks uh, like an R. Ammon, I guess. R, R, well, sometimes Arnon. Here it's Arnon. It looks like an M. Then, yeah. Israel, <clears throat> then Israel sent messages to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon, and said to him, let us pass through your country to our own place. Sihon, however, Sihon, however, did not trust Israel to pass through its territory. He mustered all his troops and encamped at Jehaz and fought with Israel. Then the Lord of the God of Israel gave Sihon and his whole family army <clears throat> into Israel's hands and they defeated them. Israel took over all the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. And now since the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel has driven the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Will you not take what your God Shamas gives you? Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, he will possess. Are you any better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years, Israel occupied Heshbon, Arar, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? I have not wronged you, but you are doing me wrong by waging war against me. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. Okay, I'm going to move this up, and here we go. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Mizpah of Gilead. And from there, he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house, to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Okay, so let's stop just for a moment. The Jephthah makes a vow to God, right? He obviously, you know, is not so sure that God is with him. Like, okay, God, you do this, I'll do this, right? It's kind of a rash vow. 
and we'll see how rash it is as we read the rest of this lovely story. And Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Arar to the vicinity of Minith, as far as Abel Karamin. Thus, Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was only a child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and her friend went to the friends went to the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. Hmm. All right, let's talk about this for a minute and then we'll take a look at what I wrote about this. Any thoughts about this story? It, it's always bothered me this story. Yeah, why? You shouldn't make rash promises. Exactly, you shouldn't make rash promises. Or promises right. that you really don't want to keep. Right. Any other ideas? She also doesn't have a name of her own. Doesn't have a name. Good. Other observations? Uh, the child is being punished for the sins of the father. Uh-huh. I, I thought Jews weren't supposed to sacrifice humans. They're not. They're not. OK, let me, let me share with you something that I wrote about this, as I did all the women in the book of Judges. OK, so. I'm calling him Yiftach because that's the Hebrew for his name. Mm. And it means something. So it's important that we look at the Hebrew. The story of Yiftach's daughter represents a marked weakening in the status of women, right? Because we had Devorah, we had Yael, these strong women, right? And then we had the woman who threw the, the, the stone on, on the guy's head, right? On Avimelech's head. Yeah. Now we have a woman who's being basically, you know, sacrifice. From a focus on two powerful women who take control of their own fate, we now focus on a male warrior who dictates the face of his nameless daughter. The story of the daughter's diminished autonomy can be seen as a metaphor for the decline of Israel's political and moral situation. As Dana Fuel suggests, perhaps to the death of the daughter, the silence of God and the absence of the people are but signs of something rotten within the state of Israel. I mean, you certainly don't get anybody saying, wait a second, you know, like let's compare this to the Derek Chauvin business, right? Nobody is there going, wait a minute, you can't do this. What, what are you doing? Indeed, the narrator of Judges precedes the story of Yiftach and his daughter with a statement that the children of Yisrael continue to do evil in the sight of the Lord. The story appears after Yotam's parable and the ascent of a shady murderous character, Abimelech, as judge, a sure sign of the times. It should be noted that to his great shame, Avimelech is murdered by a woman who single-handedly throws a millstone and crushes his skull, an echo of Yael and Sisera. By the way, it's the upper millstone, which supposedly is not as uh, heavy as other, other millstones. So that's why she was able to lift it and throw it at him. Yiftah, who follows two non-noteworthy judges, remember those judges who each got like, you know, a line or two about their whole reign after Avimelech's death is presented as a foolish, impulsive man who opens his mouth before he thinks. Doubtless the source of his name, Yiftach, which means he will open. Jephthah does not give you that sense, the English. He's also the son of a harlot, an outcast, who knows not the traditions of his people. So maybe he doesn't know what Israelites are supposed to do. He offers human sacrifice contrary to the practice of the Israelites. 
This, this story of child sacrifice has a powerful resonance with the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. And Yiftach suffers immeasurably by contrast. Unlike Abraham, who trusts implicitly in God's word, Yiftach needs assurances that God will be on his side and, for this reason, makes the fatal bargain with him. I don't even know why my professor allowed me to use him here, because she used to fine us every time we said to him about God, but maybe she didn't notice this. Okay, Phyllis Tribble calls this an act of unfaithfulness. The working out of the vow to Yahweh has replaced the free bounty of the spirit of the Lord. Because, well, a judge who would really trust in God, unlike Gideon, who needed reassurance over and over again, and Yiftach, who seems to need to make an exchange with God in, in, you know, in being able to be victorious. So there's a, a sense of not really having enough faith in God here. And perhaps that's why the angels actually stop Abraham, but they don't stop Yiftach. Excellent point. And let us not forget that Isaac is a male too, which makes things different. <laughs> So Abraham's faith and righteousness condemn Yiftach's faithfulness, faithlessness. Yiftach rashly offers to sacrifice whatever or whoever comes to greet him should he be victorious in battle. When it turns out to be his only child, a daughter, he shows only selfish concern. Again, Yiftach suffers by comparison to other biblical figures. So Phyllis Tribble says, Jephthah, she, she calls him by his English name, Jephthah, mourns for himself. Remember, he says, look what you've done to me. She's going to lose her life. He offers neither solace nor release, nor does he wish to die instead of his child, as did the father David. So when David learned that his son was going to die as a result of his adultery, mm -hmm. he offers himself. And as a matter of fact, oh, there was a beautiful story uh, where did I hear this about, oh, was it, it was, wait, somebody, oh, it was, was it Carl who told the story about, no, I can't remember where this was told. Somebody, their finger got cut off in a game. And when the father went to the hospital with his son, he said, oh, I know who it was. It was Robert Doctor. Lynn was at the funeral. Are, are you still here, Lynn? Do you remember the story? That, um, yeah, the son was telling the story about his father. And his Something father- Something about he's offering to replace yes. the zone. Yes, he said, take my thumb instead if, if his thumb can't, can't be sewn back on. Mm. Yeah. So that's what a father you know, or a mother would do. Take me instead. Take my, my finger instead or whatever it is. But here, this guy doesn't even have any, you know, idea to do something of that of that ilk. When he does eventually sacrifice his daughter, he expresses no emotion. Tribble contrasts the mechanical way in which Yiftach performs the sacrifice with the pain implied in Abraham's act. Quickly, without passing judgment, the narrator tells the deed. He did to her his vow which he had vowed. How different is the story from Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, where detail heaped upon detail slows down the narrative to build suspense for the climactic moment. I will say that I don't think the Abra Abraham sacrifice of Isaac is so you know, detailed, but mm -hmm. it is a little bit slower than this. He did the vow, bang. And, and, oh, I'm sorry. No, and the other thing that struck me is in the lack of emotion is that she goes off to spend two months with her friends and then as soon as he she returns, he kills her as if uh -huh. there was no emotion between him and the daughter at all that they no. wouldn't. I mean, it's like if I have two months left, her wish was not to spend any of it with him. Good point. Good point. So he's also presented as thoughtless. Since it was the custom in those days for women to come forth and sing a victory song following a battle, he should have foreseen what would happen. OK, so that's what women did. They would take their timbrels and, and celebrate a military victory. And so if he had given this any kind of thought at all, he might have thought, oh, if I say whoever comes out, well, it's not going to be a dog. It's going to be my daughter celebrating the victory. So if he had given any thought to the consequences of his vow, he might have noticed that this would not be a good idea. 
And, and then does he, I, I don't know if the reading is meant to be, he sort of blames her. He yeah. says, yeah. you know, look what you've done. Exactly, exactly. So if nothing else, he should not have been so callous with regard to another's life. I mean, let's say it was an animal coming out. Okay, but he said, whoever comes out as, as well as whatever. So some poor person might've come out, maybe his servant or whatever. Why, why would he sacrifice that person? Dana Fuel suggests that Yiftoff's daughter subtly condemns her father for this. Fuel says that the daughter may have known of her father's bargain. Indeed, though her father makes only oblique reference to his vow when she greets him, she instantly grasps his meaning. So he doesn't say to her, you know, right away, I made a vow, but she gets what's going on right away. Hmm. Thus, in Fuel's view, the daughter is not blindly obedient to her father. Rather, she actually comes forth out of the house quite intentionally. As she steps forth, she takes the place of someone whom he considered expendable. She thereby passes judgment on her father's willingness to bargain for glory with the life of another. Her action condemns his priorities and perhaps those of all Israel. You know, this is a little bit of a stretch, I think, but it's interesting because, you know, she seems to know of his vow. I mean, he said it publicly. It's not like he said it, you know, in a, in a secret place. So maybe everybody knew about this. And, you know, he was in battle for a while. It's not like he went out, you know, for two hours. And maybe she thought, okay, you want to sacrifice somebody and you're not thoughtful about this, then your only kid is going to go. I also feel obliged yep. to point out that God accepts this deal. That's true too. And again, and it doesn't you know, necessarily show God's compassion because this was a deal God was happy with. That good point. Someone good point. or something would be sacrificed. And it may be a way to punish him, but we don't really like the idea of punishing somebody with someone else's life. But again, when it comes to Isaac, God stops it. He doesn't stop this one or God doesn't stop this one. This assigning of deliberate action to Yiftoff's daughter dovetails with the narrator's framing of her story, a frame that contains a reversal of power between father and daughter. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the story, you think, oh, this helpless daughter, but actually she has some agency here. So here is the structure of the story. And, and, the, and the words that are in bold are important. So he, he makes the vow. He is victorious. He returns. The daughter comes out. He blames her. She accepts her faith. She requests two months to leave. She goes through lamentation. She returns. The vow is accomplished, and then it becomes a custom in Israel. The story is framed by the fatal vow that seals the daughter's fate. However, within the context of this oppressive structure, so the vow is on either side here, and so it sort of squishes the story into it. But in that context, the father's ultimate control over his daughter is undermined. There are two ways in which this is accomplished by the narrative. Number one, in a development reminiscent of Achsar's story. Now remember Achsa is the daughter who, her father gives her some kind of dry land and she requests that he give her some water. Remember that's a story that we read back in uh, the book of uh, Joshua. And also it appears again in the book of Judges. So she actually, comes forward and says, hey, you know what? I need this water to go with this dry land that you're giving me. So there's a shift in the focus as the story unfolds here. When it begins, Yifta is the primary actor, but his daughter subtly, I'm sorry, his daughter subtly takes the reins by determining how the vow will be carried out. In other words, the vow has to be you know, fulfilled. However, it's not gonna be fulfilled the way he wants to do it or probably doesn't even think about it. She's going to control how it's going to get done. Tribble notes, within the limits of the inevitable, she takes charge to bargain for herself. Just as Achsa negotiated for herself, so too does Yiftach's daughter. So she says, wait a minute, I need two months first. I need to go lament this thing with my friends. Then I'll come back. Secondly, the story does not end with the carrying out of the vow, but with a crucial addendum. 
the ritual that will preserve her memory for all time. So just the way Avimelech is killed by a woman and wants to be killed with a sword so that nobody will say that, well, we're saying it forever after. It's in the Bible, forever after. And forever after, there's going to be this custom now in Israel that she has initiated. Tribble writes, the narrative postscript then shifts the focus of the story from vow to victim, from death to life, from oblivion to remembrance. The story ends with a celebration of a specifically female ritual, which Peggy Day characterizes as follows. In terms of the ritual remembrance, her virginity is not the key issue. Rather, it is the social recognition of her transition to physical maturity that is commemorated. The postscript makes another important point. It underlines the difference in the way father and daughter use speech. And these uses are metaphors for the moral stance they each represent. As Mike Ball writes, as opposed to the cutting speech act of which Jephta is the uncontested master, the role of mothers like Deborah and daughters, daughters of Israel and the Jephta story is to perform speech acts of, mem of memorialization. So where Yifta's word has fatal and sacrilegious consequences, his daughter's word and that of her women friends serve to remind the reader of forgotten moral values. The death knell of women's power in judges has not yet been sounded because in a very real sense, it is not Yiftach, but his daughter who has the last word. So I think in the context of a very, very sad story, there is this little switch in power dynamics and in how we, how we can remember this story. So even though it's a sad story, it's not as sad as it could otherwise be. Any thoughts about this? Any questions? Yeah, uh, Teresa, did you raise your hand or? No, you're, you're sewing something. Okay, yes, Jane. I love the way you turn these stories upside down and inside out. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, Harvey. I'm, I'm missing something it, it, when it says that uh, the, uh, when you wrote that the practice will be carried on with the Israelites. What what exactly are we talking about? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, let me get the text back here. Wait a second. Let me find it. Um, let's say the young women go for four days. In right. some sort yeah. of ritual. Wait, hang on. Let me just let me. Just I'm wondering, you know, because you're talking about, you know, uh, her her being. Uh, you know, given as an, uh, on the altar, so. What Here is... it says, from this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. So there, I mean, obviously this is not something we still have now, but this is something that obviously she initiated that became a tradition. So we remember her through the story in the Bible, through this particular ritual, and she's kind of, set those terms for her story what does going out mean though i mean well they you know go somewhere other than where they live maybe out to the forest or something and they have this ritual it's reminiscent of the menstruation ceremonies of certain tribes maybe that's yeah. you know maybe that's maybe they had those ceremonies and this was a way to explain where it came from mm. you know maybe this maybe the ritual preceded this story and the story, you know, it's a story to try to explain the origin of that ritual. That's very possible. Okay, uh -huh. Teresa, you're really raising your hand this time, right? Yeah. Does it have anything to do with tuba off? Um, um, I don't think so, but I couldn't swear to it. It seems like it's kind of similar, but you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I could I could research this particular ritual, which I, I don't know really much about. And I'll, I'll see if I can find something about it. Um, yeah, Jason. The other thing that sticks with me is now after reading your analysis is how the daughter had exercise of free will in this story. She didn't have to come back. She could have fled the fate. She could have, this story could have had a lot of alternate endings because she was the one in charge of it 
at that point. Good and, point. And it's just interesting how, if you think about, we've seen other stories where there seemed to be no choice and people felt rigidly compelled, but she really does tell the, the ending. It's up to her. Right. And I think what she's demonstrating is that a promise was made to God. It needs to be carried out. And she's going to carry it out. She's not going to be a fink about it because she's a moral person where her father is not. So, I mean, unfortunately, as we go through this book, it's not going to get more cheerful except for Delilah. <laughs> Delilah is the last hurrah, actually. <laughs> Even though she's gotten a really bad rap, poor woman. She's really, I mean, when, you, when we read the story, you'll see she's really not the person that we've made her out to be. But the end of the book is very sad. And I think we may get to the end of the book. I don't know. We have two sessions in May and one in June. So we may actually get to the end of the book of Judges, which would be very exciting. And then in the fall, we can begin the book of Samuel, which is another very exciting book. Although there's lots of battles in there too. Seems to be the... Uh, context for all of this. Okay, so I think that's it for today. And uh, we'll see you soon in May. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Rabbi. Have a good weekend. Have a wonderful week. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi.